Episode 6 of Has Been Hotel, Welcome to Heaven, finally gave us a taste of the other side of the afterlife, providing insight into some major revelations, like Vaggie's origins as an exorcist, Adam covering up the exterminations from the rest of heaven, and the fact that none of these angels know what it actually takes to get into heaven. All of this raises a ton of questions, with my biggest one being, where is God. And the simps were fed well this week, as not only did we get a loot face reveal, but Cherry Bomb made an appearance as well, setting the stage for her own development in season 2. I've been itching to talk about this episode, and with our coverage of episode 5 taken care of, it's time to dive in on what is easily my favorite episode of Hasman Hotel so far. Also, if you'd have enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate it if you threw it a like, and maybe hit that notification bell so you don't miss our other Hasman videos. Picking up from the end of Dad Beat Dad, Charlie is eager for her trip to heaven so she can present her case for why sinners should earn a chance at redemption. Sadly, Vaggie does not share in her enthusiasm and is hesitant to visit the pearly gates due to her true identity as a former exorcist. But she's willing to be supportive to Charlie and pushes through the anxiety. It didn't click with me until I watched this episode a second time around, but in a weird way, Charlie and Vaggie kind of mirror Lilith and Lucifer. They're obviously not one-to-one, -one, but I can't help but notice how Charlie sees the best in sinners and has faith in hell, similar to how Lilith empowered its many denizens, and neither of them were actually from heaven, while Vaggie shares Lucifer's pessimism when it comes to swinging the minds of angel kind, because they were both a part of the system and were discarded for stepping out of line. The key difference, though, is that while Lucifer presumably felt too beaten down to support Lilith's ambitions, Vaggie is ready and willing to stand by Charlie's side through thick and thin, in spite of her own experiences and expectations. She tries to ground Charlie without shutting down her dreams. She's a good girlfriend. And hey, Lucifer is clearly learning to be more supportive as well. It's almost like being around Charlie brings the best out of people, which makes me think the show is cooking up something devious with her mom being completely off the grid and away from Charlie. Meanwhile, Angel Dust has still been trapped in a state of suffering. Our boy is exhausted and has hit a mental low due to Valentino's constant abuse. But now that he's been opening up about it to his friends, we finally get to see the one, the only, Cherry Bomb show up as she crashes the party in the hopes of turning it into a rager, wanting to aid Angel Dust with a night out on the town. And although she has his best interest in mind, it's clear she lacks the right approach to it, which stems from how she chooses to handle her own issues. And while we don't have time to unpack those issues fully in this episode, I do believe it's setting Cherry up to play a bigger role in not only the season finale when the extermination rolls around, but again for season 2 as well, where she'll slowly start to open up and try to learn healthier coping mechanisms. But I'm getting way ahead of myself. Charlie and Vaggie's scheduled portal arrives right on time, and I swear, I still have so many questions revolving around Lucifer's connections to heaven. Who opened up this portal exactly? There's clearly a middleman we don't know about that's maintained contact with Lucifer and is willing to do him a solid, which is supported by the fact that St. Peter wasn't prepared for their arrival at all. Yet Sarah, the High Seraphim, stated they're gifted to be here. I'd say Sarah could be the secret contact, but I don't think that's the case in Lucifer's position as a fallen angel. Since there's no way this will be the only appearance of heaven in Haspen Hotel, I'm assuming this plot thread will be followed up on at a later point, as I don't think the story will keep Lucifer banished forever. Also yeah, this episode introduces us to St. Peter and the Seraphim, Sarah and Emily. St. Peter's presence should confirm the existence of Jesus in the Haspen Hotel universe, given that St. Peter is one of the apostles, but both Jesus and his father, God, are absent and only alluded to. Side note, but I wish Peter's design was a bit more distinct, because as it stands, he just kinda looks like a generic angel. Heaven appears to be governed by its many angels, but for one reason or another, God is kept out of their affairs. His intervention may be a last resort that angels avoid at all costs. I know some people think that God may not exist in the Hasbin universe, but Hell of Boss already alluded to his existence, and Loot has referenced Father Dearest before, so I really think they're saving him for something. I hope they're not dancing around God because they don't want to face any backlash, because if other adult animated series like Smiling Friends, Family Guy, and South Park can throw their hats into the ring, the show about heaven and hell shouldn't be excluded. 
Plus, you have Homelander on the same platform as has been, saying stuff like this. No god, the only man in the sky is me. However, I could buy into the idea that they're holding off on god until the show is closer to its endgame, so that when they do tackle him, if there's backlash, it won't matter because the show will already be wrapping up. If I had to guess, God may have either abandoned heaven for reasons unknown, or is preoccupied with other affairs, like trying to keep tabs on Earth. He's too busy trying to help humanity get their shit together to worry about the afterlife, so he entrusted the responsibilities of heaven and hell to his angels. Or, since it seems like the angels created heaven on their own, maybe he's managing another universe entirely. That every time a big bang happens, he gets that universe situated with their own council of angels and moves on to the next, having no time to focus on a single one. I mean, in a show full of daddy issues, wouldn't God abandoning us be the ultimate daddy issues? But hey, that's just, just the theory. The theory. Heaven is presented as a perfect paradise, where there's no struggle, no suffering, and no one below a California 8. However, we're quick to learn that the inhabitants of heaven are being shielded from some pretty horrific truths, such as the fact that no one but Sarah and the Exorcist are allowed to know about the exterminations. Which confirms my previous speculation that Adam is a completely transparent about what he's doing in hell, because he isn't transparent at all. Now, in my video on episode 2, I did theorize that the LED masks the exorcists wear were actually manufactured by Vox and were used on the exorcists to brainwash them, forcing them to obey Adam's orders. After all, Vox's products hypnotizes the consumers of hell. Adam is shown to operate the embassy remotely through holographic technology, and this collaboration would mean that Vox creates his own economy by capitalizing off the fear of exterminations despite being someone who directly contributes to them. In some ways, this episode denies that theory, but in other ways, it kind of supports it? We learn that Vaggy was an exorcist who was terminated by Luke after sparing a young demon child, losing her eye and her wings as punishment. If all the exorcists were brainwashed into obeying Adam, I don't think it would make much sense for Vaggy to hesitate in this moment. But since these exterminations are already secret, I'd argue that Vox still could have made these masks. It just influences the exorcists to keep their misdeeds a secret rather than forcing them into killing angels or blacking out whenever the masks come on. Vaggy couldn't have come clean to Charlie because she's physically incapable of doing so. Charlie only could have found out if someone else broke the news to her, like in this episode. Or maybe after Vaggy was given the boot, Adam invested into new masks that keep all of these angels in line to ensure another soldier like Vaggy never steps out of line again. But this episode does provide an alternate explanation for their exorcist existence. Adam claims that he named Vaggy after the best thing ever. You know, lady parts. Combine this with the fact that all the exorcists appear to be women, and you start to get the implication that Adam was directly involved in the creation of the exorcist, which suddenly reframes his love for ribs as seen in Overture. Why? Because in good old Bible lore, Eve was created using one of Adam's ribs. So all of these exorcists come from this dude's chest, which I guess responds every time he throws down on some famous Daves. But this would explain why so many of the exorcists share his bloodlust and disdain for sinners. They're an extension of him, hypocrisy and all. But if that's the case, then I think Vaggy's sheer existence proves that somewhere deep inside Adam is a conscious. It's just like really deep in there though. You'd probably get lost trying to find it. If all of that isn't messy enough, none of these angels have a single clue on what it takes to get to heaven, which is giving me good place vibes for anyone else in the room who's cultured. Adam claims that it's an arbitrary set of rules that he obeyed, which is why he managed to get in despite being... him? Seriously, even Sarah seems confused on why he's here, let alone being the first human to get into heaven. I'm also willing to bet that Adam misconstrued his actions to fit the rulebook. You need to be selfless? Well, let's say he was a cheater, which, come on, would surprise nobody. Well, he could say that he wasn't really cheating on them. They were just all in need of a great partner. So he stepped up as the man of multiple households. Don't steal? Well, let's say he did eat the fruit of knowledge. He could argue that he didn't steal it. Eve offered it to him. 
and stick it to the man? Maybe that has something to do with God himself, or it's tied to how Lucifer got banished to hell. It's very obvious that there are a lot of double standards and rule bending in heaven, from these rules to the court case itself, as Charlie is looked down upon for swearing while Adam is talking like he was written by Vivzy Pop. Oh. This episode isn't all doom and gloom, however, as it highlights the growth the guests of the hotel have had between Sir Pentius and Angel Dust. When Pentius checked in, he was just another Saturday morning cartoon villain, who wanted to be as feared as the overlords because he believed it was the only way to earn respect. Now he's dropped his goal of dominating hell, and claiming everyone as an adversary, in favor of befriending others, and just generally trying to be a chill dude. He now tries to earn respect by respecting others the way it should be. Angel Dust has grown tremendously by letting down his walls, communicating his feelings, and accepting help from his friends, recognizing that he has a support system worth protecting, sticking up for that support system so they don't go through the same hardships that he did, risking retaliation from Valentino after the dickbag makes his gross remarks about Nifty. And I have a feeling this will be followed up on in the next episode. Angel also avoids drowning out his sorrows with drugs and reckless partying, turning down Cherry Bomb when she wants to indulge him in her party animal antics. And speaking of Cherry Bomb, she's pretty much where Angel Dust started in the beginning of the series. She actively chooses to rely on drugs and partying to avoid self-reflection. She still has her walls up, and she doesn't want to look after her friends if it gets in the way of her fun. I think the trajectory of her character from here is pretty clear. She'll likely kick ass in the extermination, offering the gang a helping hand. And in the aftermath of the extermination, I could see her taking up Angel's offer on checking into the hotel, treating it like rehab as we finally get to learn what makes her tick in season 2. At least, that's what I'd like to see. I really hope it isn't eons before we get to know this character on a more personal level, because it does seem like she's hiding a lot of pain. After the castle observes Angel Dust's journey of self-improvement, but still refuses his admission into heaven, we have have an incredible song that unfolds into a wicked reprise as Emily acknowledges how screwed up this all really is. And through this song, Adam exposes both the extermination and Vaggie's true identity. His reaction to leaking this news reinforces the idea that God isn't really around right now, as he doesn't even try to hide that he believes it's the right thing to do, that he takes immense pleasure in it. No harm, no foul. He wants to rub it in Charlie's face and let his colleagues know that it's all for the better. And Sarah herself is drinking the Kool-Aid that sinners were uprising against heaven and she's afraid to try anything else as she doesn't want her or Emily to end up like Lucifer. But here's the thing, from what we know about sinners, I don't think they would try rising up unless they already felt threatened. Basically, Adam could have shot first. Sinners had the appropriate reaction, and Adam used that to justify the exterminations in the first place. This hearing turns into a kangaroo court, as Adam pretty much triples down on his stance and makes it clear that he can abuse his power to get away with all of it. But I think Sarah is going to come around and end up supporting Charlie, as not only did Emily vow to make things right, but I think she'll reflect on Vaggie and realize that not only are sinners capable of becoming better people, but angels themselves are too. None of these beings are that different from each other, and the only way to stop this war is for heaven to admit that their system is flawed. But of course, Adam won't accept change so easily. But I think Vaggie's arc thus far proves that Adam is wrong about everything. Vaggie was able to listen to her gut and improve as a person after defecting from heaven. It shows that sinners aren't the only ones capable of growth. Angels are too. It shows that the system is inherently flawed and protects people who don't deserve the privileges bestowed upon them. And if a demon, nigh, the princess of hell, is the one to enable Vaggie's growth, then why wouldn't she be able to redeem tried and true sinners? We are heading into the season's endgame with the final two episodes, and I can't wait to see what happens. But for now, what did you guys think of Welcome to Heaven? What are your theories on the exorcist and the whereabouts of God? Let me know in the comments down below, and keep the conversation going on Twitter and Instagram at AustricVox. Check out Tunja for some dope cartoon-inspired merch, like the Curse of Feathers and Mud and Three Stars shirt, and if you enjoyed this video, please sort of like, and subscribe to the roundtable for more great cartoon content. Thank you for watching, there's more has-been content on the way, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace!